How you doing tonight? Ivy Nation Sports Talk is up and rolling. I'm Sean Styers. I, oh, I was about to say that empty chair is my co-host tonight. <laughs> Forgot my drink. I had to get something to wet the wet the willet or the, yes. whatever. Yes, Vince slid into the empty chair. So you went uh, you went bowling tonight, huh? Squeezed a little family bowling in between shows yeah. today. So we did it uh, yesterday. If did we you really? Yeah, we could That's have funny. easily ended up there at the same time. Was it packed? When you were there? No, not at all. It was pretty empty. We won uh, something like 4,000 of those tickets. You know, like, did you go to Strikes and Spares, I assume? We, we went to the south side, actually. We went to Chippewa. Oh, yeah. okay. That's that's interesting that we both went farther <laughs> than, you know, like. Well, then we needed to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, we spent $60 for okay. the, because we had. We had to wait 30 minutes to get in. So we spent 60 bucks on one of those little cards that like you go around. Oh yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like the carnival in the front of the bowling alley. Yep. There and you win the tickets and then of course, you know, again, like the carnival, you take it up and then for however many tickets are you can get whatever. So 4,000 tickets? Yeah, I was I was uh have you been in they have this claw, this okay. giant claw and they they have these rings. And on each of these, and the rings are like about the size of, you know, like a dinner plate. Okay. They're like that big around. And on the outside, they have uh, ticket values, you know, like 100, 150, yep. 300, 600. And three different times, I stuck the claw in there and brought out multiple rings. Wow. I was I was the claw ring champion. You are a yesterday. champion. So Man. the bottom line was, because we had to wait 30 minutes to get into bowl, um, we basically, my daughter got a water bottle, this collapsible water bottle. We spent 60 nice. bucks. She got a water bottle. In return. <laughs> I got a collapse. And but you memories. feel like you earned the water bottle. And then you think about it. It's like $60 later. Yeah. Well, you got memories. Could have bought a whole a box of water bottles. Yeah, you could have, but that's okay. Yes. Believe By me, the I'm way, not... I've got, Ugh. I've got uh snack cracker news to, uh, to deliver in this what? show. What does that mean? Very interesting stuff. Our old friend Carter Carls, formerly of the South Bend Tribune, yeah. who's covering Florida State at the Cheez It Bowl, has some Cheez It news, Ooh. and I'll get to that in rapid fire later. I think you it's just hilarious. Bringing up stuff that I don't even know what's happening. I don't even know what's. I'm just along for the ride, just like everybody <laughs> else. Let's go. <laughs> yes, Sean is a boss. That's right. I was. I was feeling it last night. I went. I think it was. I got th- my last two times. I got three of these rings. With the claws, I got I'm like impressed. over a thousand, I think, total in my last two dips with the claw into dips those rings. Very <laughs> proud of myself. Ah, that's great. <laughs> All right, well, glad to have you with us here tonight. We've got a lot of quarterback stuff we're going to talk about. Of course, we do tonight. You know, uh, you know, the report is out there on Sam Hartman. If you've been to our boards, you know, it's like yep. it's a little bit of a touchy subject i get we're going to delve into it you know we'll we'll save that for a little bit you want to talk about gator bowl because that's what the boss wants us to predominantly talk about this week is the gator bowl absolutely let's go let's talk gator bowl because we got another name football game to talk about that happens to be taking place in a couple of days three days and uh it's our last chance to see notre dame in an actual football game for quite a while so I'm excited about it. We are not Marshall can just change his name to Salty, I think. Uh Buckner's been put on a pedestal by Notre Dame media and fans. And uh, he was saying earlier, little TB12 talk tonight, has there been a more polarizing player in the last five years that gets talked about so much with so little production up to this point? Sure. Uh, How about um, uh, Tobias Merriweather? He has one catch for one touchdown. That's all anybody Excellent. can ever talk about. How about Excellent that? Point. How about Excellent any point. one of the linebackers at Notre Dame that is a freshman or a sophomore right now? But Vince, they're all being buried on the yeah. depth chart. What are you talking Man, about? You can go on and on about players that we talk about with zero production. So, you know, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> give me a break. Oh, my goodness. All right. So, 
I guess the inevitable, you know, what we knew was going to happen, Tyler Buckner, just for We Are Not Marshall, we're going to talk even more about Tyler Buckner without That's any right. Yeah, we will. Yeah, you know. let's go. Marcus Freeman uh, announced him officially as the starting quarterback yesterday. And, you know, we've been talking about him since, since uh, what, the, the end of November, mm -hmm. I guess, when, when, you know, it started kind of popping up that, hey, Maybe he's out there on the practice field, and it turned out he was on the practice field, and he was getting ready to go, and now here he is. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're surprised by this by any means. Not right? even a little bit. I mean, I – no, I'm not surprised at all. And, you know, there's people out there, obviously, that, you know, there was some thinking that they would he would split time with Stephen Jelly or whatever the case may be. The way I understood it was part of the conversation with Drew Pine was that, look, if Tyler is healthy, he's our number one quarterback. He's our starter. And right. I don't necessarily have a huge problem with that. And so the fact that he was named the starter doesn't surprise me. That means that he's been given the all clear by the doctors. And he has probably also outperformed Steve Angeli in practice because Mar uh, Marcus Freeman said that they have both taken reps with the ones. And from here on out, it'll be Tyler with the ones, Steve with the twos, and Ron Paulus the third with the threes. Yeah. So I don't think anybody's all that surprised at the way things have matriculated through. I'm not, frankly, and I not that close to the situation, well, but I'm not surprised. No, I mean there's there's the whole line of thinking that a starter shouldn't lose his job because of an injury. And sure. now this, you know, this took a what the better part of three months, I guess, for him to to come back. But right. He won the starting job in training camp. And it and wasn't close. Yeah. And so he, he won the starting job. Obviously, he's injured. The team lost both of those games. Things did not go sure. well. Sure. But once he was healthy enough to be back, here he is. He's got the, the job back. Now, you can obviously argue that at this point, Drew Pine had more experience than Tyler Buckner. So sure. should that experience have mattered, you know? There were ups and downs. You know, at this point, it's water under the bridge. But I, I guess the bigger question, if if Drew Pine had stayed, yep. what do you think the quarterback reps would look like this Friday? I still think that Tyler Buckner would have eventually been named the starter. And it would have been, you're the starter. And if we have to bring in the backup, we bring in the backup. I don't think, what is the schematic advantage to bringing in Drew Pine as a package quarterback if he is your number two? I don't think yeah. there is one, if I'm being honest. And if you look at it from just an X's and O's situation, unless maybe like a two minute drill type situation, okay, if they like, like, like a Tommy Reese, something when like that. It yeah, was Everett exactly. Golson, like that whole thing. I could exactly. potentially see that. Uh, I could potentially see that. But I, you know, I just did Drew Pine do anything that would tell you? Not he took the team eight and two over the 10 games. He's got a ton of experience now. I get all of that. But did he do anything during his tenure as the starting quarterback to say, he's the starter? Hands down, no more competition. He's the starter the rest of this year and going into next year. I don't think he did. Like It's not, you know, you can say his biggest win was Clemson. He had 85 yards passing or whatever it was. You know what I mean? They didn't win that game because of him. Yeah. So I, I it's not a situation. Yeah, it's not a Wally Pip situation. It, it's not a situation where he took a stranglehold of that starting position and nobody on the roster is better than him. Like I don't, I right. just don't think that that's the case. And that's see, that seems to be kind of the attitude that he had when when Marcus Freeman told him the yes, news. The combination of you know, you know it was becoming obvious that Tyler Buckner was getting more reps in practice, and there was a chance that he was going to work his way, you know, back to being the starter as long as he was healthy enough. And they have determined that he is healthy enough, and you know now we know he's going to start. But between that. And the transfer portal quarterback news, you know, like it seems like that, you know, like the, you know, the question was, if Pine had stayed, what would the reps look like? Just based on the information that he received, I don't think he was going to, you know, there, he he wasn't going to stay around, you right. know, because this is part of what ticked him off. The fact that Tyler sure. Buckner was was working, like, and just what you said, like, it seems like Drew Pine thought that, like, he had done such a phenomenal job that there's no way he should be displaced for the job that he did, you know, 
during the season. Now, again, we've been through this before. We don't have to completely relitigate it. And he's already signed with Arizona State. So bygones, you know, but at the same time, Drew Pine did some good things. He had a really good stretch. But Drew Pine also had some valleys out there. And, you know, to your point, he did not do anything over the course of 10 games, which is obviously almost an entire season. He did not do anything to 100% without a shadow of a doubt say, he has got to be the guy. There was there was enough doubt that they obviously felt like right. there was more upside for them with Tyler Buckner getting back in the mix. And it's and it's regardless of what anybody thinks of Tyler Buckner, because I know that there's a lot of anti-Tyler Buckners out there. And that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm not going to knock that. But regardless of what you think about him, if you look at what Drew Pine did, he didn't get a stranglehold on that starting job. And it was a combination of the fact that they said, that they, from what I understand, they told him, Hey, number one, we're going to go look at the transfer portal for a quarterback. There's going to be an open competition in the spring. And number two, you're not guaranteed to start in the bowl game because the original starter for our season is going to be healthy again. Yeah. So there's no guarantees. And he decided to take his resume, which on paper is not bad, right? You were the starting yeah. quarterback at Notre Dame and he's looking for a, a nice soft landing spot. He found one at Arizona State. Now he's not going to have the opportunity to have the offensive line that he had at Notre Dame. I mean, that that goes without saying. Right. But his resume as a starting quarterback at Notre Dame, eight and two, all these different things. He's a great leader. He's this, he's that, he's the other. That is a great resume for a transfer quarterback. And yeah. good on him for finding a spot. I mean, that's, that's awesome, right? Yeah. But the bottom line is he wanted to jump ship. And he felt that that was his best opportunity. And that's fine. But I think... Over the last two weeks, I think we have all realized that you don't necessarily need to be in the portal to find a home either. So there's that. But that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Mr. 2.0 says he thinks, especially with Mayer out, Buckner gives him the best chance to win <clears throat> pine or no pine. You know, and that's an interesting way of looking at it. And I, I, I think that he probably does. Oh, I will be curious to see how much he does run. You know, is, is he going to need to run as much? because of the fact that the offensive line is so much better. But, you know, the the bigger point is this offense should be able to stretch the field a bit more. They should be able to go about things in a different way than they did when Michael Mayer was in there. And he does, you know, he does open up some different things in in terms of they already have a really good running game, and he has to be respected as a runner as well, a dangerous runner. He just has to know when to get down if he is going to go. And they need to not – hinge the run game on him like that that that's a mistake going into the game and I don't think that they will do that based on the way the run game has performed throughout the season and the way the offensive line is playing and the running uh-huh. backs I don't think they're going to do that I hope they're not going to do that you well, it's can't funny do because that. I ha- I was having a little you know early in the Marshall game I was having a little press box debate with you know someone from another outlet sitting nearby and it was like Buckner's got to run more they can't run the ball and then of course you know fourth quarter comes along and look what happens yeah so yeah but you can slide you know you can no there's no doubt about that yeah um we're not marshall no one's saying this quarterback room is playoff contention type of room not buckner pine or angeli the starter who wins us a playoff game and national championship is not on the roster and i agree with that and that's why they've been looking to the transfer portal to bring in somebody else i I can see where that's coming from. And no matter what Tyler Buckner does in this bowl game is going to change the mind of, of anybody uh, that hates him. So, I mean, he could go out there and throw for 350 yards, four touchdowns and run for another. And it's not going to change anybody's opinion. Yeah. And I guess I I should say like the Tyler Buckner we've seen so far, that Tyler Buckner is not going to win a playoff game or national. And I have no problem with that. There's still potential, but none of us have seen it yet. And that's why, you know, Buckner kind of gets labeled with that. I do still think there is potential there. I do too. But we've got to see a lot of talent. He's got a lot of talent, but I think at this point we can safely say that he is injury prone. He, I mean, he, he has injuries that, you know, he's injury prone. I get that completely. Right. He also has not had a chance to be behind the offensive line that he's going to be behind in the bowl game and moving forward for that matter. So it's going to be, Again, you can't put everything on the bowl game that is coming up if you're, you know, a, a Tyler Buckner fan or if you're a Tyler Buckner hater. But if he balls it, out, 
If it he changes, balls out, it's a new conversation. I'm it sorry. It's a conversation quite it a does. bit, especially I, going into the offseason, right? It absolutely, it's going to be one hell of a competition with whoever they bring in as a transfer and Tyler Buckner. And for that matter, Kenny Minchie's going to be there in the spring and Steve Angeli is going to be there in the spring. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have a four way, you know, competition. Now, I don't think it's going to be an even comp. Like, it's not going to start out with everybody right here. I, don't, I mean, I, I just think that's unrealistic. I think you're going to have the transfer and Tyler kind of here. And then you probably will have Steve and whoever the incoming fr- and, and Minchie, you know, kind of a step behind. But that's just reality. I mean, from an age and an experience standpoint and all of that. So, you know, again, it's not going to change anybody's mind, but it will certainly make the conversation different, in my opinion. Charlie Weiss's last belt loop with a super chat. Tyler hasn't even thrown a touchdown pass this year, which is kind of crazy to think about it. Like, it, cause I've, you know, like gone back and looked at his stats a couple of times. It's like no touchdown pass, but he did run for a couple, but uh, well, he says it's high expectations to expect four touchdowns from him. And it, Hartman isn't coming to be on the bench. He says, and okay. I didn't say he was going to throw four touchdowns. I was, li- I was actually saying that is like a sarcastic situation. I'm not anticipating that he throws four touchdowns, but what if he does? What if he does? Yeah. I mean, it's possible that I, I can tell you right now. And if you watched the show earlier today, South Carolina's defense, not very good. I mean, they were already top, not very good and they're missing both top two corners, two corners, gone. both gone. Plus some defensive linemen. They're, they're, it's like both like, sides of the ball. You think you think that like if if as a Notre Dame fan, you're worried about maybe losing I, you know, with, with Isaiah Foskey and Michael Mayer not being there. It's like South Carolina is missing just swaths of the team that they're not gonna have on both sides of the ball. Top now, two rushers, tight ends, right. running backs. Notre Dame is losing two guys. They're two of their best players. Don't get me wrong. Michael Mayer, Isaiah Foskey. That's it. South Carolina is gonna is missing like six to eight legitimate starters on their team. Their tight end depth chart is one guy. One guy. It's not even a depth chart. It's just a guy, right? I mean, that's obviously just an example, but Notre Dame is in a much better situation from a depth chart standpoint than South Carolina is going into this game. Number one running back, gone. Two yeah. tight ends, gone. Number one, number two corner, gone. Their best defensive lineman gone like it's a lot of that's a lot to overcome just it is you know just saying so is it out of the realm of possibility that Notre Dame can take advantage of the fact that South Carolina wants to run a lot of man-to-man and you know do a lot of things and maybe Tyler Buckner could eat on that it's not out of the realm of possibility for me no I know and that you know Tyler Buckner's got to be a smart runner if he's going to run but but the fact you know they want to play that much man-to-man with a quarterback like Tyler Buckner, you have to be able to take advantage of it. You know, you know, again, now you don't want to have to rely and you shouldn't have to rely on him to be the sole guy running the ball. The way this line has developed over the course of the season and what we've seen from a running game that at one point was averaging well over 200 yards per game. It is still at what it's like 186, I believe it is right now. So we, we know it's a good running team. We know it's a good offensive line. And I think that Tyler Buckner, can only add another element to it. Do you think Steve Angeli is going to play this Friday at all? I don't. Not unless not unless Mr. Injury Prone gets hurt. I mean, I don't I it's going to be a number 1 and a number 2 situation and number 2 only comes in if you're winning by a lot or losing by a lot or, or an injury. Like those are the only that's the only way I see him playing if I'm being honest. And you know, it just it is what it is. Yeah. The touchdown to interception ratio Micah is zero to two for this year. What about total? Did he throw any touchdowns last year? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we're talking about his career career. this year. I mean, again, he threw a a couple through some of the Virginia tech game, but that's when he, yeah. 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 I don't think Angeli's going to play either unless they say we're going to give you a series in the second quarter or, you know, and or the third quarter or something like that. I just, I don't see it, but but I do think the best thing that happened to Steve Angeli is one, you know, again, you don't want to see your starting quarterback get hurt, but when Buckner got hurt, when he moved from the scout team into right. that number two spot and he got, he got reps with the offense the entire rest of the season, I think that helps him quite a bit because it is going to be a quarterback competition in the spring Absolutely. and he's still going to be on the roster. Yep. And 
you know, he might not be the one that a lot of people are talking about right now, except for that, you know, Steve Angeli fan base, <laughs> which is out there, which is fine. But he's going to be part of that competition, at least to some extent as well. So yeah. three to five is his touchdown to interception ratio. Three to five. Career. Yeah. It was three and three last year and zero oh and two this year. So yeah, there you go. Yes. So there's all that. right. And, and And let me just address this real quick. Whoever the transfer quarterback is that comes into Notre Dame, it is very, 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 very clear to me that no one is being promised the starting position. Now, the, it, let, okay, let's pretend and say that it's Hartman or whoever is coming in here. Do they think they're going to come in and win the battle? I hope so. I mean, I hope that's what they think. But there's nothing that is being promised to anyone. And I and let me reiterate the fact that last year was the same situation. That's why certain guys did not come to Notre Dame. They went someplace else. And those guys are now in the transfer portal again, trying to find their third and fourth school. So Notre Dame is not promising anything to anyone. So no matter what anybody else thinks out there, that is not happening. Now, if now, Sam Hartman or whoever thinks they are, that's great. They can think they are. I want confidence coming in here to Notre Dame. I want that. I want competition. But nobody's being promised a starting position. Nobody. So there you go. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Now at the same time, we had a quarterback competition this fall. We had a quarterback competition last fall. Both of those air quote competitions were done within the first week of training. Oh, yeah, it was obvious. Now they had the spring to compete as well but i think it's good it's it's only good that there's competition do we think that they're going to bring in a transfer quarterback to sit no you wouldn't think so especially if it is hartman and he's got five years experience like no you wouldn't expect that but if one of these other guys wins the job against a guy with all that experience i would think that you've got to be feeling pretty good about those guys absolutely yeah. I mean, I love I love how everybody thinks they know what's going on. That's awesome. That's good for them. That's <laughs> hilarious, frankly. You're gonna get a double dose of salty Vince if you keep it up tonight. Jeez, it's Don't unbelievable. make me stop this car. So DC Irish and Jelly and Buckner should split snaps. This game should be about playing young guys. No. Figure out your depth chart is more important. I mean, this game is about winning the, the game. Chart. The yes. game is about winning. That's what it's about. It's not yes. about is this an, let's is this everybody play. an exhibition game or is it a game that you're trying to win? Because no. it's a game you're trying to win. It's not about just running young guys out there. Hey, let's see what you got. That's what practice is for. Like we may not be able to see those practices, but that's what coaches have. They, you know, that's why they film it and they go back and watch that film and they evaluate the film and they, you know, evaluate them when they see them live. That's what that's all for. So yes. It's about winning the game, okay? I'm not going to do my uh, – what? oh, gosh, what was his name? Uh, former Arizona State coach, right? Uh, Herm Edwards. Play to win you the game. Play to win yeah. the game. Look, they want to win this game. It's not about everybody getting a participation trophy. That's not what a bowl game is about. A bowl game is about winning. Can you take things out of losing? Sure you can. No doubt about it. We've talked about that all season. But it's not about just, hey, let's let all the young guys play and see what they can do. That's what practice is for. Right. Okay. That's not what games are for. Right. So, you know, people saying that are probably the ones that want that have all their participation trophies hanging up <laughs> on their wall behind them. Okay. That's not what it's about. Isn't Period. isn't that what that board behind you is for? Isn't that for like an IB participation? The participation trophy award right board there or something. That's what it is. Back there. <laughs> and for the last time, whoever comes in has the opportunity to start. They are not guaranteed to start. There's a big difference, people, a big difference. And again, this is, and we've talked about this before, but this is this is essentially based on what we have been told. This is why JT Daniels was not at Notre Dame Correct. last year. And he's because, back in the transfer portal, by the way. Yeah, right. And he's at <laughs> Rice now, by the way. And that's yeah, what he's the Jesse one you and I were talking about this last starter. week. It feels like, oh, mm -hmm. Rice. And they're, they're like rolling out the red carpet for JT Daniels because it's like, hey, you don't have to compete for a job here. Come in. You'll be the starting quarterback. But I have no problem with them telling him, you know, last year in the offseason, look, if you want to come here, you're not just going to be named the starter. You have to compete for a job. And it's somewhat similar to what we're talking about with Hartman. Now, you know, JT may be 
a bum, but he still had starting experience. And that's, that's, that's the bigger picture point. Correct. I think is whoever you're going to bring in, you're going to tell them you're competing for a job. You're not being handed anything. You've got to compete for it and win it. That's hilarious. Notre Dame is in no position to dictate. Uh, it's their team. It's their program. These coaches can dictate whatever yeah, the hell they want. I think they are. What are you talking about, <laughs> dude? They can dictate whatever they want. Like, well, come on, man. He was in here earlier. He's a hater. He's an SEC guy. Ah. All right. As far as the depth chart for this game, anything stand out to you? And and again, we're going to talk specifically about Hartman at the top of rapid fire. So that's coming up here in a few minutes. Yeah. So if you, like if you came for the Hartman talk. We'll get more into it, okay? We're we're, we're gonna we're gonna jump into it a little bit more once rapid fire starts. So we're we're just kind of we're pushing it to that depth chart, Vince. Anything jump out at you? Not specifically. I mean, the depth chart is pretty much identical to what it's always been throughout the entire season. The only difference is guys that have decided to not be on the team anymore are no longer on the depth chart. I mean that that's really the only difference. I mean, I made this point earlier today you know if we're if we're talking about the depth chart depth chart specifically junior two alamaca has been practicing at what position sean viper and where is he listed on the depth chart nowhere middle linebacker was it, oh that's two. right he's number two yeah. middle linebacker he's I'm the sorry. number two middle linebacker <laughs> like okay i mean i pretty much take the depth chart with a grain of salt i don't it doesn't mean anything to me it uh, you know it's not like the coaches are beholden to only playing the guys that are on the depth chart. And if you're number one on the depth chart, you get this percentage of snaps, et cetera. No, I, the depth chart means pretty much buff kiss to me. Yeah. It, it literally says Tyler Buckner or Steve Angeli and Marcus Freeman said well, he's the number one quarterback. So who do you remember the offensive line depth chart? I'm trying to remember who was at the top of the offensive line depth chart going into Ohio state because Patterson was injured. And then, they basically ended up starting somebody else, or was it Marshall? One of those two games. They ended up starting somebody. Do you remember that? Do you remember oh, what I'm talking about? Yeah, vaguely. But yeah, again, the depth chart means zero. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Even though we did an entire show breaking down the South Carolina depth chart today, uh, <laughs> the depth chart means nothing. It means nothing. So, <laughs> well, and especially for them, it's like, who are these guys? I haven't seen you since <laughs> since you were in high school. Yeah, a lot of these I know. guys. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, like, you know, yeah, like Chris Tyree continues to be the number one running back. There you go. Chris Tyree hasn't started a lot of games. Right. See. And even if he so. does, is he going to get the majority of the carries? Right. Probably not. I mean, right. he's he has become kind of a gadget running back, a third down running back kind of a thing. They'll put him in the slot, they'll move him around. It's exactly what they should be doing. But again, the depth chart just means nothing to me. I, I, it's great to have it. It's easy to find guys, you know, quicker than looking at the entire roster. So, I mean, it's nice to have, but like, does anybody here think that Jalen Steen's not going to play in this game? If he's healthy and ready to go, he's not on the depth chart. So that must mean he's going to ride the pine the whole time. Come on. Now. Yeah. Like that's, that's I mean, they're going to get, they're going to get guys like him yeah, out gonna there. Play. You know, he's only played three games to begin with. And this was something else. I can't remember. I don't. I think it was Jesse and I talking about this. Like the NCAA came up with that bowl game exemption. So if you've already played in four games, you could play in a fifth game, the bowl game, and it not have it count against your, um, you know your right. your eligibility. You could keep your red shirt, which is great because you have all these people in the transfer portal. You know, so sure. it helps you pre preserve and get young guys in. Well, it would have been nice if they had made this that decision at the beginning of November. So that, you know, maybe exactly. they could have even gotten Snead on the field for one more game. Well, they would have gotten Angeli in, in one of the blowouts towards the yeah. end. Remember that was a whole if thing. They were preserving they were him about? because they didn't know. Yeah. Like, why That's would you right. not tell coaches that this was a rule earlier than now? Like, right. it's so silly. Like, But it's typical NCAA. It's typical. Right. Very typical. Uh, Father David Penny, would that count for playoff games as well, hypothetically? I and now I so. assume we're talking about the eligibility yeah, thing, but I yes, so because yes. I mean, it's the only opportunity that you have to play more than one game, it's only gonna obviously right. basically you could instead games. of four, you can go up to five now <clears throat> this yeah. year. But but he's saying, could you play six? Could you play two because they're both postseason? You know, are either one of those gonna count against your red shirt? Good question. 
it only affects two teams out of the 130. So, right. You know, right. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. I can't say for sure on that. But yeah, I mean, we're going to see like the depth chart. Sometimes they just kind of throw some names up there, it seems like, because what the depth chart and the two deep say does not necessarily translate into what we see out there on game day. One guy who started to make, you know, kind of some inroads for himself toward the end of the season, we started to see more of Jordan Botello. Yeah. And he's a guy who kind of has me has my curiosity peaked going into this Gator Bowl because of he's going to have an opportunity. You know, he's been around for a long time now. Yeah. You know, and there's it's always been, you know, potential, potential ability, you know, it's it's all there, but he hasn't put it all together yet. So He's going to get an opportunity in this game uh, with the absence of Isaiah Foskey. I believe he's listed as the number two Viper. So he's going to get his opportunity uh, in this game. They can't just play one Viper. So Jordan Botello is going to get some time on the field. And I also wouldn't be surprised to see the backup Mike linebacker playing some Viper as well, even though he's not listed on the depth chart at that position. But since that's where he's been practicing for the last month, that would make sense to me. So yeah, I, I think we're going to see, again, we're going to see a lot of people out there that we haven't seen much of in the past, and that is fine. That's great. But again, at the end of the day, the goal is to win the game. So, yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Salty's asking if a guy could play three games, then four playoff games, keep his red shirt. You know, one, the four playoff game scenario doesn't come for two more years. So I'm sure by then they're going to tweak this again to yes. some extent, I th- it's I a believe one year thing right now I believe it said you could play mm-hmm. in one extra game, you know, it on did, top but of I'm, the four. But it wouldn't I surprise believe. me if the NCAA didn't even think about the fact that two teams are playing two games in the postseason. Like that thought probably never even crossed their mind when they made this rule. But I believe it's just for this year for whatever reason. I don't think that's a continuing situation, but I guess we'll find out. Right, Vince. Are you ready for rapid fire? Are we there already? Is it well, time? Well, it's, it's because we've, you know, we promised that we were going to save the Sam Hartman talk <laughs> for rapid fire. And we're at the Sam Hartman point of the show. We're start <sighs> we're starting to get more Hartman stuff and you know, it's it's coming in. We might as well ag- just address the elephant in the room. So, yes, as much as we can. I mean, there's only so much out there. Again, No promises by us are being made here, but the report is Pete Thamel of ESPN says that the Wake Forest quarterback is in the transfer portal. It is official now after this stuff started leaking out before their bowl game last week. Notre Dame is among the favorites to land his services. And now beyond, you know, whether or not it happens or not, you know, again, there's a connection there, how far we're going to go. You know, we don't need to go in to that, but NFL scouts are projecting Hartman as a third day NFL draft pick, likely sixth or seventh round is what they're saying. So the thought is Hartman can improve his stock with another year in college, which would be his sixth year, by the way, he's Mm -hmm. getting, you know, the extra COVID year and everything. And so Thamel says that ESPN reached out to three different NFL scouts about Hartman. None of them believed Hartman is going to be picked before the sixth round, if at all. So as far as he's concerned, there's great benefit to going someplace yes. else. It's the slow mesh Wake Forest offense, uh, you know. That you'll like, never see in the NFL. That's ever. right. Get out of that and go to a more conventional pro-style system, which obviously is what Notre Dame runs. So at the very least, Vince, starting with this, Hartman seems to be a good, like the two seem to be a good match for yeah. each other. Hartman for Notre Dame and Notre Dame for Hartman. I. I like Sam Hartman, uh, the player, you know, I I think that he's got a really good arm. I think he makes good decisions. I think, you know, he's, I think he's a guy that could very much benefit Notre Dame. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I, you know, whether he comes here or not still remains to be seen. He's not going to make an announcement until after the bowl game. So, I mean, it's all speculation at this point. Good for Pete Thamel for putting it out there. That's great. Uh, but uh, there was rumblings about this, what, about a week ago, Sean? We started yes. hearing some things out of the Wake Forest camp on the day of their bowl game, which roughly so awesome for that kid that he's having <laughs> to deal with that stuff on the day of his bowl game. Uh, but 
you know, I, I think it's a good match. Uh, as Brent Smith, as Brent Smith said, he could, he could have the ability to come in here and compete to be a starting quarterback for him personally, being the starting quarterback at Notre Dame for a year could greatly benefit his, his draft stock. And he'll also be able to put a little NIL money in his pocket where that's, if you're the if you're the starting quarterback at Notre Dame, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to make some NIL money than if you're the starting quarterback at Wake Forest. And that's yes. just a fact. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. So I'm sure that's part of it. I, I mean, I'm sure that's part of the situation. You can either go and potentially be a, a, a non-drafted, an undrafted free agent and try and make a team with no NIL money. Or you spend another year in college, work on that master's degree, get some NIL money, be a starter someplace if you win the job. I don't see the downside of him staying in college. Yeah. He obviously didn't boost his stock enough this year. If this is the kind of stuff that, that NFL scouts are, are telling, you know, ESPN and, and whoever else. And the guy is second only to Philip rivers in ACC history with over 12,000, almost 13,000 yeah. passing yards, 110 touchdown passes. So he has a ton of experience. So if you, Look at Notre Dame, and you look at what Notre Dame needs. They need an experienced quarterback if Tyler Buckner is not going to be the guy. Now, again, just like we said earlier, we expect these guys, if it is Hartman, to compete for the job in the spring. Absolutely. You, know, you, you expect that whoever they would bring in. And, you know, look at, look at Jack Cohn as an example. Jack Cohn playing in a much more conservative offense in Wisconsin. Basically, he had the reputation of being a game manager. And look what he was able to do in yeah. one season coming to Notre Dame. I, I think you have to say that his stock was greatly elevated by playing for one season at Notre Dame in this offense with a worse offensive line and a worse running game than what Notre Dame has right now. So, again, I think it's a perfect fit on both sides. And is it, is it official yet? No. You know, and the other part of this is the timing of this. And this is, you know, like word started getting out, I believe, just before the Gasparilla Bowl, you know, when Wake Forest was was yep. playing down there. And so word starts getting out at that point. And now you've got Notre Dame creeping up on its bowl game. And the last thing that Notre Dame <laughs> wants is dealing with this kind of stuff when they're getting ready for a bowl game and you have another quarterback preparing to be the starter Correct. in that game. You know, and that's why from, from the Notre Dame perspective, when we talk about, well, how much are we going to say? How much are we not going to say? That's essentially why. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, here's the way I look at it. If it's a legitimate competition between Tyler Buckner and Sam Hartman next year, if Sam Hartman is the guy or whoever this, whoever, look, I, I feel like Notre Dame is going to go out and get a good quarterback, whoever it happens to be. I think they're going to find somebody who wants to play at Notre Dame, who wants to be the starting quarterback at Notre Dame. They're going to get a good quarterback. So whoever wins that battle is going to be the best man for the job and gives Notre Dame the best opportunity to win, whoever that happens to be. And if we're talking about Sam Hartman specifically, his game is not similar to Tyler Buckner's game. So you're going to be seeing two completely different styles going head to head to see who's going to win that job. I yeah. don't know who they're going to bring in. Maybe it's going to be somebody that's similar to Tyler Buckner. Maybe it's going to be somebody that's similar to Sam Hartman, like a Jack Cohn or somebody along those lines. Now, Sam Hartman is much more mobile than, than Jack Cohn, but we don't know, but the odds are it's going to be guys that have two differing styles. And what is the offensive coordinator at Notre Dame going to be more comfortable having, you know, lead this offense? I think that's right. going to have a lot to go, you know, a lot to do with it. It's going to be very interesting. So I, I will say this, though, after watching the Colts play the last few games, Jack Cohn, man, they should not have gotten rid of Jack Cohn. I think he could have done something <laughs> for that team. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like you go back to Nick Foles. There's a reason Nick Foles Woo! has been on the bench for five years. Yes. And my goodness. Come woo, on. Woo, 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 woo. Super chat from Wicked Bronco Productions. <clears throat> Hartman plus Notre Dame equals Natty contenders, contenders, in my opinion. Thoughts? He made Wake Forest relevant in football for once and way less talent than he would have at Notre Dame. Absolutely. A guy with this kind of experience, this is why you're bringing in potentially a quarterback with this kind of experience. This is why – whether it's Hartman or anyone else, they wanted to go out and find an experienced quarterback. Because look at look at how things played out 
this year. If they had an ex- a, a quarterback with Jack Cohn or you know this kind of Hartman experience this year, it's a lot different result that we have this season. Oh, I look. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Notre Dame's a quarterback away from being a national championship contender. Right. That they just are. And whether that quarter, you know, you can get all the pushback you want, whether that quarter that quarterback is going to be on the roster in the spring or not, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. There, there's a proven track record with Sam Hartman, no doubt about it. There's a lot of talent with Tyler Buckner, no doubt about it, but he doesn't have the proven track record. And then you've got an incoming freshman like uh Kenny Minchie, who's got all the talent in the world, too. Unproven, right? So I they're a quarterback away. They're they're building talent all around on the offensive side, on the defensive side, special teams, all of the above. There, there's there's an opportunity there. And whoever wins that job, I think is gonna have a great opportunity to lead Notre Dame to areas where they haven't been before. Fill in the blank, Vince, with other transfer quarterbacks like Devin Leary, Hudson Card, DJ Uyongalale already at other schools now, after leaving their schools, they're already at new new schools. It would be blank if Hartman does not end up at Notre Dame. It would be a tough blow for Notre Dame. I haven't heard, you know, specifically what quarterbacks they're in on, you know, moving forward. I haven't really been paying attention to that part of it. But if they can't bring in somebody of his caliber or him specifically, that's going to be a tough blow because you want to bring somebody in who's a legitimate comp- competition, who can legitimately lead this team, just like we were talking to or talking about, can legitimately lead this team to a playoff victory, a playoff victory. I'm not even saying a national championship at this point, a New Year's Six victory, a playoff victory. Neither one of those things has been achieved at Notre Dame since 1993. So I'll take either one at this point. They need to bring in somebody that can do that. Yeah, and The list is shortening. Now, again, Jack Cohn would not have been at the top of anyone's list two years ago. Agreed. And Jack Cohn ended up going 11-1 and one in the regular mm-hmm. season. And you can argue that if they had changed the offense sooner, he could have very easily be 12-0. and 0. You know, didn't have a good first half, obviously, against it today. But if they had changed, you know, changed things a little bit sooner, that could have been potentially even different. But then, you know, now we're rewriting history and we're we're looking at, someone else probably still being the head uh, coach here if that happened. But if, my point is, yeah, well, there are other quarterbacks out there. So it's not the end of the world if a guy like Hartman does not ultimately no. end up coming to Notre Dame, but at the same time, this is a guy with a lot of experience and again, he's had a lot of success against ACC competition and uh, I think that you put him into this offense, I think that that it would be a big step up and would be a guy who is going to have you in playoff contention at Look, the very least. I will go to my grave thinking the fact that Jack Cohn would have led this 22 team to an 11 and one record. And if Notre Dame's 11 and one and their only loss was an opening week loss to Ohio state, Notre Dame is the number four seed right now in the playoff because it's not Ohio state because they beat Ohio state. So, and they both would have the same record. So I am 100% convinced that Jack Cohn would have had this team at 11 and one and in the playoffs right now. Now they'd be preparing to play Georgia. Who knows what would have happened at that point? I think Notre Dame matches up decently well against Georgia, but that's what, that's where we, that's where we would be. I'm, and I, I am 100% convinced that that would be the case. So, uh, Say what you want to about Jack Cohn being immobile and being in a maple oak tree or whatever somebody said. <laughs> like, that's fine. But I think he has this team at 11-1, and one and they're in the playoff. Yeah, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. What Now, the only the only thing, like, could he have put the, 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 the team on his back against Marshall? Because that was still a team just like last year that was not running the ball at that point. Sure. I, I think he makes – I think he makes that throw – to Braden Lindsay at the end of the first half. Yeah. And if that happens, Notre Dame wins that game. Yeah. I think it boils down to one throw Very at true. that point. You yeah. know? So, yeah, I do. C-Mac, Sam Hartman is Cliff Kingsbury. Basically, if NCAA had portal back then, main reason he's taking COVID year is because NFL scouts have him as a day three NFL 
draft quarterback. So why are fans counting TB out? I don't know that everyone is counting Tyler Buckner. I'm out, not. I'm but not again, you're you're talking about a lot of experience. And you know, if we're going to compare Jack Cohn, again, it's not like you know, Jack Cohn had some experience, but he was far from spectacular. Like if you're going to compare what Jack Cohn did at Wisconsin compared to what Sam Hartman has done at Wake Forest. No competition. Yeah. Like the, the scale is completely on Sam Hartman's side in that case. Yes. So absolutely. And again, absolutely. that's why you're going to the portal because you want someone with experience that you can drop into this team that has a lot of talent around it that can take you to another level to, to win you at least two of those games because the quarterback play was up and down, sure. just like what you were talking about. Yep. Like, like, may, you know, maybe Cone hits that, you know, that pass against Marshall. Maybe, I, yeah, 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 I think Cone yeah, yeah. would hit the pass to Braden Lindsey against Stanford instead of sailing yep. it into the stands. And yeah. you wouldn't have seen, you know, like people were commenting earlier when we were talking about Drew Pine. You wouldn't have seen balls in the turf and balls overthrown and forcing balls to Michael mm -hmm. Mayer. Like Jack Cone knew how to throw to people other than Michael Mayer. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. You expect that Sam Hartman is going to be able to do that as well because – it's not just that he has all these touchdowns and all these passing yards. A guy with five years of experience, regardless of what offense that he's been in already, you expect him to be making quick reads and be able to you know, get you in and out of, of checks at the line of scrimmage that a young quarterback who, you know, let's let's face it, both Pine and Buckner, that's the biggest one of the, you know, two of the biggest things against both of those guys is, you know, that's that's why you had all this you know, check with me stuff at the line of scrimmage because sure. both of those guys, at least in Tommy Reese and Marcus Freeman's help, needed, or in their opinion, needed a lot more help along those lines. And being able to make those reads was not, you know, not an asset for either one of those guys. And you expect that to be an asset for a guy with the kind of experience that Hartman has. And look, I, I think C-Mac is absolutely accurate because if if Sam Hartman was going to be, is he if he was projected as a day two quarterback, which is rounds two or three, do we really think he's going to the transfer portal? I don't. I think he's going to the NFL draft. And if he's a day two quarterback, he's probably going to make a roster, which means he's probably going to make decent money. So I, the NFL draft stock thing, I think, is absolutely legit as to why he's going into the transfer portal. Right. Absolutely legit. That doesn't make him any less of a great fit for Notre Dame if he ends up at Notre Dame. But that's 100% why he's going to the portal. If, if some team was like, we are drafting you on day two, you know, if he, if he was projected to be a day two guy, rounds two or three, there's no chance he's coming into the portal. No chance. Because Sam Hartman, no matter what he does at Notre Dame, well, I shouldn't say what he does at Notre Dame, no matter what he does anywhere, unless he goes out and wins a national championship and he is the reason that they win a national championship, he's not going to be a round one quarterback. So your best bet is to be a day two guy. If he was listed as a day two guy, there's no chance he goes to the portal. Trucker Joe brings up a fair point. Pause with the Sam Hartman talk till after the bowl game. There's a reason he isn't declaring for the draft. Yeah, and that's you know that's exactly why he's available. But again, whether he's declaring for the draft or not, you can win. You know, Alabama has shown before that you can win championships without high end first or second round Absolutely. quarterback talent. No question. Does anybody? Does anybody think that uh, the kid from Georgia is going in the first round as a quarterback? Right. No. There's a good chance he's going to be a two-time national champion. <laughs> so <laughs> never have to buy a drink in Georgia again. You know what I mean? So, you know, it is what it is. That's fine. All right. We're going to close the book on this pretty Please. soon. because We've already talked about it quite a bit. Copies for closers. Are we sure we're getting this guy after the last book? Notre Dame fans are on the ledge. Not getting him after this build up would be the tipping point. I mean, You're not wrong. I mean, it would just be you just walk up to some guy and just be like, <laughs> and then they Whoa! like they. There's no doubt. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. That's why people need to not get their hopes up at this point because there's always a chance that this goes a different direction. Someone's gonna swoop in. That's right. There's Other always people a want experienced quarterbacks too. I guarantee you. This you know, people, people. There are a lot of people who would like to have a guy like this. Absolutely. Timey says if Hartman can kill the scan offense, it's worth bringing him. <laughs> I don't necessarily disagree with that either. I yeah. hate the scan offense. Always have, always yeah. will. I just. Bleh. Yep. All right. <clears throat> I've got some audio we're going to play here. Yes. So we've talked about talk about something else. 
We've talked about how Notre Dame is not going to pay the acquisition fees to land <laughs> high school recruits. Here's what Marcus Freeman had to say about that last week. Yeah. I don't acquisition fees i don't we don't no you know we don't speak to that um is it a part of recruiting yeah i mean because you discuss it It, it's a topic of discussion um but in terms of acquisition fees we're not going to get into that you know we can't um because again if that's going to be the reason tim that you decide to come here man it's it's hard to keep you here you know and and that's what I think we all as coaches and competitors that want who we view sometimes is the best, right? We want the best. We want the highest rate, all these different things. We have to understand it's still about getting the right guys here. You know, when you look at last year's class, what again, that was another top 10 class. I think I looked at it the other day, maybe four, maybe four or five guys played this year. Didn't redshirt. I mean, out of a class that we signed 22 to 25 guys, you know? And so, I say that's important because if you're coming here for an acquisition fee, as you said, um, or you're coming here for NIL and you don't get that instant gratification of playing right away, that's, it's going to be tough, right? Tough to stay here. And, and that's what we got to understand is when you bring these guys in, it's going to take a little bit of time to really be able to run out there in Notre Dame Stadium and have a huge impact on our program, it takes time. Very few guys can come in here and play and start right away. Ben Morrison, listen, I don't know how highly rated he was, and he was the only guy in that freshman class to start this year, you know, and we've had a couple guys that played, but um, the majority of guys redshirted, highly recruited guys, highly rated guys, but they've decided to stay and say, okay, hey, I got to develop. I got to continue to commit to a program and this team and my development. Those are the guys we need because as you look back two years ago, a lot of those guys, the Blake Fishers, Joe Waltz, and some of those guys, those are the ones that are playing a lot of ball for you now. And so it takes time to really make that adjustment from high school to, to play in major college football. And so we need guys that understand the value of this place and what it will provide in the long run because you're not just going to get that instant gratification that some guys are looking for. All right, so there's Marcus Freeman with a uh, very long but very well thought out good response to the whole acquisition fees, paying the upfront money, the pay for play money to get recruits to come to Notre Dame. A question that I have heard a lot in the last week from fans is well, okay, if they're not going to get into it with high school kids, what about using it to land the transfers, the grad transfer? type guys do you buy or sell that Notre Dame needs to make that kind of investment Vince even if they're not going to get upfront acquisition fees with the high school kids I still sell it I mean you can you can offer NIL deals and things like that to grad transfers that's fine but it's not going to be a blank check situation it's be like hey we've got a couple of these businesses that would love to talk to you there's going to be an opportunity if you're a starter you earn it like that kind of a th- i have no problem with that i still have a problem with the the blank check mentality the the acquisition fee you know hey you come here guaranteed a million dollars or whatever the case may be no i don't I will never be on board with that. It's one of the reasons that I follow this team and that I like the fact that Marcus Freeman is 100% bought in to the way that Notre Dame is going to go about recruiting and they're going to go about using the transfer portal and all of that. I, I, he buys into it. So I'm buying into it. I, I think that there's a way to be successful by doing it the way that they are doing it. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Now you can say, Hey, here are the deals that Michael Mayer, Isaiah Foskey, like these guys. See, have and had. that's that's where you can that that's where you can lay out some yes. facts for these Absol- guys and absolutely. say we may not be willing to write you as you said a blank check or or X amount of dollars. You know, even if it's five hundred thousand or a million or whatever. You know, two million, obviously. So, you know, some of the numbers depending on who you're talking about. But you can say, look, NIL has only been around for two seasons. Now, you know, a year and a half calendar wise, two seasons of college football. Here's what our guys have been able to do. You know, whether it's Michael Mayer, Isaiah Foskey, you know, again, like Braden Lindsay is someone who spoke to it earlier this year. It's there. And all you have to do is get here. We're not going to give you anything up front. We're going to, you know, this is going to be actual, 
you're going to use your name, image, and likeness once you get here. And there's a lot of money to be made yes. in it by, by being a college football player for the University of Notre Dame. I mean, Isaiah Foske had his own clothing line, okay? Like, that's a pretty serious NIL deal, all right? It's not just a blank check situation. He had his own logo. Like, these guys are making money. They're doing just fine, and they're yeah. capitalizing on their time at Notre Dame. Kyle Hamilton, you know, look at him. Right. He had the podcast and, you know, as you said, the logo and the whole thing last year absolutely there there's plenty and that's what you do for a grad transfer that's coming in you say look here's what so and so and so and so did these opportunities are there for you if you want to come in we're not going to promise you x amount of money and if you don't want to come that's fine we'll find somebody else that wants that you know what i mean and so i you know i'm i'm totally fine with that i'm totally like for example hudson card he signed with purdue right and everybody, he was kind of the number one guy that everybody wanted at Notre Dame. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we really think that Purdue wrote a blank check to Hudson Card to come to West Lafayette? Right. Do we really think that that took place? Well, I, I think he got celebrity recruited by Drew Brees is what yes. I see. <laughs> 100%. Yes. And touche to Purdue yeah. for having that ability to do that. I have right. no problem with that. Notre Dame does the exact same thing. Are you kidding me? They They dip into their alumni pool and and have them talk to to players and you know and all of that so look i have no problem with that but not everybody again is out for the bag that's not exactly how it works now you can, again you can show people how they can make money but they just don't have to have a blank check yeah i concur yeah i, I think that that you know again it's it's tough when you see notre dame lose out on a couple of guys especially the highly talented guys you know and like you 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 look at some of the, you know, different reports, like the different people breaking down, you know, like the, the aftermath of, of recruiting who won, who lost and all this stuff. And you see Notre Dame pop up on the, you know, who lost list, but none of these people are mentioning, you know, Oh, they lost out to Oklahoma, you know, and then it was going to, you know, what, whatever, but sure. none of these people in their analysis of this are mentioning what it took for Oklahoma and you know Oregon to get these players away from Notre Dame like they're right. not they're not mentioning the, the the true story you know they've completely not even buried the lead they're not even mentioning <laughs> the lead they're talking about a completely different story than what actually went down the why and that that to me is like you you can't you can't analyze what Marcus Freeman and his staff did in this recruiting class did or didn't do without mentioning the fact that you know, again, I, I realize nobody wants to call it NIL, pay for play, whatever, that that big money is what have ultimately swayed these guys Absolutely. to go to some other places. And, you know, I realize that stings, but I just I don't see Notre Dame, you know, saying, well, we're not going to do it for the high school kids, but but we can sink this money into right. these other guys because they've been around the block. You know, the grad students, I think you do it exactly the way you're talking about. And it's the same way you do it with the high school kids. And that is OK. Here's what it looks like at Notre Dame. You're going to play for one of the most high-profile programs in the nation. And even though we're not going to give you all this cash up front, you're still going to be able to cash in pretty big in your time here, your four or five years, whatever it turns out to be. And there's plenty of examples that they can point to for that. Plenty yeah. of examples. So they're just not going to put it all out into the media and into the news about how much each player is made. That's just not going to happen. So again, these players are being presented with plenty of opportunity to make NIL money, and they're doing it the way that NIL was intended to be used. And so my hat's off to Notre Dame and the other schools that are doing it the right way. And you know what? You're going to lose out to some people that are just offering $2 million to a high school kid. You're going to lose out to some of those, and that's fine. But to me, that's not how you build a college program. It's yeah. not how you build it. Crystal brings up a great point as well, because mm -hmm. Card is a three, you know, he's got yeah, three true. years of eligibility left. And with what they have coming in at the quarterback position, sure. you don't need a guy around for three years. You need at the most two more years of quarterback, at you know, depending most. on what these other guys do, you know, whether it's Buckner or Minchie next year and, you know, uh, how quickly they're able to, to get ready and be the guy. And then obviously you have Carr coming in after that. That's absolutely right. You don't need, a quarterback like card for three years because then that just creates another issue down the road 
Right. Fill in the blank, Vince. When the college football playoff expands in a couple of years, this past weekend, with its below zero wind chills, you and I were here in South Bend all weekend, that would be what these teams would be playing in if the playoff had started. Was it this so, past like would it have been this past weekend? Is that when they would have done it? Well, yeah, you would have had you would have had uh yes, there would have been games okay. going on this because of the the four rounds of the playoffs. There would have been games going now. You know, they might have scheduled around Christmas and stuff like that. I don't know exactly how, but right. it was cold in the north, is my point. Oh, yeah. So it would be blank if teams were playing in those kind of conditions in playoff games. I think it'd be great. I mean, look, the NFL didn't cancel any games because it was cold. They played, and it, the first person that says, well, they get paid, yeah, back up five minutes on the podcast. No names get – I mean, you know, college football players are getting paid too. So right. – Dude, I have no problem with it whatsoever. And if teams are going to come into Notre Dame Stadium, let's say Notre Dame is a, is hosting one of those games and it's below zero or whatever the case may be, that is the ultimate home field advantage. And I hope it's a team like Miami or Texas or somebody like that coming as up to Notre fan, Dame Stadium. Though, as a fan, would you want to be sitting out there? Hell no. <laughs> I'd be watching that. it from my basement. Are you no, kidding me? But you're me? absolutely right because I'm thinking well, – what yeah, because I thought the same thing about NFL, and I'm like, well, you know, these are regular season games. They're not playoff games and all that kind of stuff. But I can re- – you know, I remember back like it's been – I think it was the, the, the Giants' first Super Bowl run, you know, with Eli. Okay. When they went up to Green Bay – and like Tom Coughlin's face was frozen red, and like right? people could barely move their faces. It was so cold and yes. all that stuff. It's like it's it sucks that you would play important games out there in that. But if you're Notre Dame and you're hosting one of those games, I think that there is a great chance that you're going to be hosting somebody from yes. a warm weather yeah. state and you get them in here, and that is an advantage. For you, because even yep. if you're not out there every day in that stuff, you're at least more used to it than some of those others. Now, again, like the fan aspect, you know, do the fans want to sit out there in that? I don't know, but it's like it's you know it's like yeah, uh, with it, it, either you're seeing the snowfall like we did at the Boston College game in the second half, or right, when you right. see their breath, like like those are the two visuals that I love when I'm watching a football game. I think it would be, you know, my my initial. Re- thought was like eh, do you really want to do it and then the more i started thinking about it it's like yeah yeah you absolutely do. Yeah, i do. i think it's the ultimate home field advantage uh, look i i will be the first one to say i will be up in the press box in the warmth i will not i will be there and i will be super happy that i'm indoors but i would love to see notre dame host a warm weather school if it's like 10 degrees outside are you kidding me and because it's a playoff game it'll probably be at night oh <laughs> That'd be, I'm sorry. Sign me up all day for that. All day. Yeah. Got a bonus question that just came in from Adam. In your opinion, how important is this bowl game for Marcus Freeman's growth as a head coach? Didn't you have a question similar to this? It was very similar. And I was, I kind of passed it up because I figured I could save it for for Friday for countdown. But I think it's it's different enough that we can come back to that one on Friday still. And we'll talk about it. Because I was looking forward to answering that question. I didn't realize we skipped it. Okay. But anyway. For this question, how important is this? I think it's important. I think it's actually really, really important. I, I think that, you know, if he loses and they end up being successful down the line, you know, next year, the year after, whatever, it'll be a footnote. But I also think that when you're building something, when you're when you're establishing a foundation with your culture and all of these things, he's still a first-year head coach, right? Winning this game against an SEC opponent, an up-and-coming SEC team in South Carolina, because I do like – what coach Beamer's doing down there. I think he, I think he's going to be, you know, a good coach. I'm not saying that they're going to be the George, the next Georgia, the next Alabama or whatever, but I think they're going to give people a scare over the next few years. I like coach Beamer. I think he does really good things. And so this game checks a lot of boxes for Notre Dame. And I had mentioned this early, earlier in the previous show, Notre Dame's eight and four. It's a disappointing season. I don't think anybody would would disagree with that. It's a disappointing season, but you still have the ability to knock off an SEC team with the caliber that that South Carolina is at right now, where they are. They're a middle-of-the-road SEC team, but you have an opportunity to knock them off. I think you have an opportunity to check off a heck of a lot of boxes if you're Marcus Freeman, 
and this staff. So yeah, I think this it's actually really important to the growth, his growth as a head coach. Yeah, I think so as well. I, I just think that nine and four feels a lot different than eight and five going out, especially when you've already, you know, you lost to USC to end the season. You've got a, you've got somebody else's quarterback and you're, you're, you're basically a year later, like this is your first full team. So yeah. again, you know, like the whole, I'm not going as far as saying, you know, this is really important for the off season and, and off season momentum and those kind of things. But I think for Marcus Freeman to show his growth over the entirety of the season and to, to be able to finish at nine and four, the win over an SEC team. And as you said, you know, like another good young coach and all those different things show where his program is now with some adversity being thrown in. You know, you don't have the opt-outs that South Carolina is going to have, but you do have this whole thing going on at quarterback. You you know, it, you're going back to the guy at the start of the year, I think for Marcus Freeman, for Tyler Buckner, for all of them. It's a, it's a really big opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. And there was a, a question up here I wanted to get to. Yeah, here we go. Where are Marshall says as a five seed, that would mean we play the second ACC or Big 12 team. No, you'd be playing the group of five team, most likely, uh, because they would be the 12 seed. So it would be five versus 12. Right. You'd be playing Tulane again, like this year, or you'd be playing Cincinnati, or you, you know, you'd be playing the best. Well, Cincinnati's not going to be a group of five team anymore. They're moving to the Big 12, right? So yeah. It would be whoever the best group of five team is. That's who you're going to play. So now if you're six or seven, that's a different conversation. You're going to be hosting a power five team. So Right. Josh, wouldn't playoff games start a week after conference title games? They would not. There's there's a two-week buffer okay. in between. They wait two, they're going to wait two weeks after the conference championship games. And this is part of why we talked about this before. That Thanksgiving weekend, there's a good chance that conference championship games are going to be moved back to that. Now, to you know, to to the point that could still shift the the the, the calendar a little bit in terms of what weekends these games are being played. But they're talking about potentially moving things up. So conference championship games are Thanksgiving weekend. So you would not have all the rivalry games Thanksgiving weekend. You would have them a week before that instead. But when you're talking about four different rounds of playoffs, you need right. at least a month to play these. That's so, true. so that's why you're still going to be, you know, like Christmas weekend or somewhere around there, you're going to be playing in late December and in early January, you know, and, and potentially even the middle of January, depending on if maybe they push it a little bit farther yeah. that way. So you're going to be playing in the middle of winter, no matter what. Yeah, no doubt. And again, those teams in the North for that first round that are going to be on campus sites, you've got an advantage. I mean, the Michigans, the Ohio States, the Notre Dames, whoever that happens to be, you know, north of the Mason-Dixon line, if you're hosting, you've got an advantage playing in December. No doubt. Crystal wants to know how harmful it is it to never be a one through four seed. It's not to me. I mean, I don't think it's harmful at all because, again, if you're the five, you play the 12 at home. I mean, if you end up being a six, then you wouldn't have been one through four in the first place. So, you know, that's – I have no problem with it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me in any way. Yeah, to me, <clears throat> my initial reaction when this – when that plan – and I think you and I even talked about it back in, our, you know, the, the radio days when the, when the plan was initially still in its working stages. It, it was a proposal at that point. Right. I didn't like it because of this. And it's like you're going to give that up, but then the more you sit and look at it and – from Notre Dame's perspective, Notre Dame obviously values its independence and an expanded 12 team playoff field. Even if they're not going to get a first round by, it gives them a better chance to be in the playoffs year in absolutely and year out. So even if you have to eat it and play an extra game, if you're one of the better seeds, you're going to get to host some of these games. So that's good for you as well. And the fact that you're in it, you get the revenue from it, all these different things. And don't forget, because they're not in a conference, they don't have to split the revenue with conferences. Right. And Derek makes a great yeah. point here. You get a buy, you get a during, buy conference during conference championship, championship week instead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, point. there's really, yeah, is there a downside to not getting a buy? Okay. But all those teams that get a buy, they're not playing at home either. They're going to be playing in designated bowl sites, right? 
So I like having a home game. I think it's going to be fun to host a playoff game at Notre Dame Stadium. I mean, I look, I don't go to a lot of away games, right? So I get to be at a playoff game. I, I, I find that to be pretty darned exciting, if I'm being yeah. honest. So I, I like it. Shy tennis are teams reseeded after the first round of the playoffs. I, so. I don't think they're going to do that. I haven't seen that specifically yeah, mentioned. Like so. the NFL always makes sure that the best, you know, like the number one seed is always going to play the worst remaining seed and that kind of thing. I don't think right. that uh I don't think that's in the plan for right now, but we'll see. That could always change as well. So Vince, the NFL had just three games on Christmas, or they just had three games. Excuse me, on Christmas Day. If you were a player, would you want to play on Christmas? And as a media member, would you want to cover a game on Christmas? As a player, you play when they tell you to play. Like, I don't really have an issue as far as that part is concerned. I mean, it is what it is. You're getting paid a lot of money to entertain me. And that's why you play when most people are off work. And that's why they play on Thanksgiving. And you know what I mean? So I I don't really have a problem with the players. On the flip side... I would hate it as a media member that I would have to cover a stupid game on Christmas. If I'm not Tony Romo or Troy Aikman and those guys making millions of dollars. Yeah, that would suck being away working on Christmas. It's always fun to be able to flip on your TV and be entertained by these games. Yeah, But it's a big difference when you're actually working those games and you're away from your family. You know, they're holidays for a reason. They're family holidays. So. Correct. I would hate it. My my wife would hate it. My kids would hate it. It would be terrible. I mean, I know you can say, well, we'll just have Christmas on a different day or whatever. Yeah, you can say that. It's not the same. I mean, it's just not the same. I mean, I no, I would not enjoy that in any way. I'm glad that we don't have a professional team around here that we have to cover that would play on Christmas. I'm I'm actually very happy about that. We're not Marshall. Four likes. Come on, y'all. We're better than this. Yes. yes Hit the you like are. button if you would. Come on. Come on, people. Don't get lazy. Seriously. <laughs> Don't get lackadaisical. Come on. Hit the like button if you would. Subscribe, rate, and review. We've got just a few more things to hit here before we wind down. Michael Parks pointed out Nick Foles whooped Tom Brady's butt in the Super Bowl. This was back when I was kind of ripping on Nick Foles a little bit. You're right. You know, he caught lightning in a bottle. Look. Players have been known to do that. Timmy Smith, remember, is still the record holder from the Washington Redskins, uh, it, you know, against the Broncos and John Elway back in the 80s. He's still the record holder for most rushing yards in a game, but his yep. career was basically over Look, after that. I give Nick Foles a lot of credit. He made a career on a postseason. Yeah. That's what he did. He made a career – on a postseason, he's got a statue out in front of the vet or whatever they call it these days because he led his team to a Super Bowl championship. He was the MVP, and he has made all this money, whether it be in Jacksonville or Chicago or Indy or whatever. That's what's crazy is five, five years later, the head coach and the quarterback who won the Super Bowl, both of them, neither one of them are with the team anymore. And yeah. The head coach is down in Jacksonville – about to turn around Urban Meyer's mess into a potentially yeah. AFC South champion, and Nick Foles is still hanging on. You're right. Foles, Foles was great. But like I said, my point was he hasn't played for, you know, he hasn't started for the last five years. That right. was it right. back then. Right. And I, Think I about Doug to... Peterson. Doug Peterson turned Nick Foles and Carson Wentz into people who can win a, you know, win a championship. You're not wrong. And listen. The media, they don't get holiday pay. This There's is no such hour, thing as holiday pay. This is pay not an hourly way. gig, okay? We don't <laughs> right. get holiday pay. That's it's a nice thought, Irish Shy town but uh, there is no holiday pay when you're in the media. Yeah. So. Yeah. Last place I was at, even when I was part-time, didn't pay time and a half for working national exactly. holidays. Exactly. Jamie yeah. wants to know if there's going to be an IB Nation stream during the bowl game this Friday. I don't think so. Uh, but you never know. I, it could be something that I find out about at the last minute. I'm there will down. be an IB countdown to kickoff, though. Yes, there will. Good segue, my friend. Vince and I will be there. Jesse is bringing his whiteboard to oh! IB countdown to kickoff. Ten o'clock Friday morning. Nice. Yes, the whiteboard nice. will. The whiteboard will show up for the Gator Bowl. That's right. So I, I believe, and I don't want to speak for you, but I believe that's the next time that you and I are going to be on these airwaves. Is going to be Friday morning. That's right. I won't be here the next couple of days because I'm actually heading to Florida myself. For, That's right. Uh, Speaking of holiday basketball. pay, you're you're heading down to do women's basketball. Yeah, 
That's the closest thing to holiday pay I get is trips to warmer weather, even though it's a little cooler than usual down there in Florida. It's true, but it's warming up. We're going to have a heat wave. It's going to be 50 degrees on my birthday. I'm kind of excited about that. So. And yes, Michael, or Mr. Oops. 2.0, rather, excuse me, there will be a post-game show. Of course Absolutely. <laughs> this is my favorite. You guys need to talk to, to Driscoll about renegotiating your contract <laughs> on holiday pay. He lets us have the holidays off. So yeah. it's all good. It's all good. I'm already happier with my compensation here than I was at the old place anyway. Yes. So hey, I you will I'll never hear it. me complain about my compensation. I'll That's lump it for, sure. for now. I'll lump it for now. Yes. One last thing tonight. So I, I promised some snack cracker news at the start of the show. Our old friend Carter Carls, who used to work at the South Bend Tribune, he's down, he covers Florida State now, and he's at the Cheese It Bowl. And he tweeted this today. A Cheez-It Bowl representative told Carter last night, there is no such thing as Cheez-Its, plural, with an S at the end. No such thing as Cheez-Its. One Cheez-It is called a Cheez-It. Two or more of the Cheez-It are called Cheez-It crackers, not Shut up. Cheez-Its. This, to me, Vince, That's... is like USC telling us, not to call them Southern Cal. Uh, it's it's a che- it's, it's it's a plural. It's a plural of cheese it. One cheese it is a cheese it. Yeah. Plural is cheese its. Right. Can we all agree on this? Uh, you're not going to get any kind of disagreement from me. Now I do have an issue with people like I'm going to Myers or I'm going to Walmart's. Like they just put an S on the end for no right. reason. The, you're not going S, to multiple the random Walmarts. S adders. Yes, those people. But that's yeah, not that, what this that is. A little annoying. There, there, right. there, there are multiple crackers. One is a cheese it, two are cheese its. Right. I'm sorry. There is one the Dario. There are five, six, what, seven Dario's. Correct. Plural. They're all, I can hear them. They're all up there. <laughs> so, yes, they're, um, come on. That's <laughs> Irish Shite Town. This is great. Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly Thank that. you. I'm with you on that. It's total. As John would say, total BS. I got a hankering for some Cheez-Its right now. Yeah, I do too. I got some white cheddar ones upstairs. I might have to dive into them and just be like, look, I have Cheez-Its. Just to <laughs> say it. I don't have Cheez-It crackers. <sighs> Come on, people. It's being difficult. It's being difficult. Never heard this before. And oh, they're God. they're out there tweeting the truth as well. So there you go. Yeah. It's what they say. All right. Well, again, hit the like button if you would. I forgot to, you know, give my disclaimer at the start of the show, and apparently people slacked off on the like button tonight. So <laughs> it was over hit 60 the like button. last time I was in there. But come on, yep. people, let's go. Subscribe, rate, and review. <clears throat> Are there shows the next couple of days, Vince? Like, what's There's going on? Do you definitely know? a show tomorrow at one o'clock? I know that for sure. It's going to be okay. Brian and Ryan. After that, I don't know. I don't know what's okay. happening on Thursday. I'm checking out completely. So, like I said. We'll be back with Jesse Friday morning for IB Countdown yes. to kick off leading into the Gator Bowl, and there will be a post-game show and all that good stuff as well. But uh, I'll be uh, I'll be Miami bound Oof. tomorrow and then in Miami after that. I'm excited. I'm excited to watch. I'm going to watch that game. <laughs> I'm going to watch tonight. Men's basketball play tonight, but they're playing like Jacksonville or something, which is odd since Notre Dame football is headed down to Jacksonville. But uh, again. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, I hope they win too because uh, <laughs> it hasn't looked great recently. That's right. All right. Great stuff tonight, Vince. I will talk to you later and we will uh, talk to you later as well. Appreciate you stopping by tonight. IB Nation Sports Talk. <laughs>